maybe 10 minutes for questions and uh, very short comments. And uh, we have uh, the uh, final comment from Amanda Paul. And uh, then we come to, to uh, discussion, uh, not informal discussion. So please, who, who is... Hello, I'm uh, a member of uh, youth movement, uh, um, European generation. My name is Alexander Ivanov, and I uh, I really like what uh, Amanda said, and I just wanted to make a small comment on uh, human rights in Ukraine. I just wanted to give a, a short historical example on the the use of tools of of legislation system. When uh, USSR made an agreement with the uh, United Nations about human rights, they, um, they had, in the headquarters of USSR they thought that it's something like a piece of cake, it's, it's not important. But this agreement gave uh, an opportunity for Soviet dissidents, um, it gave an opportunity to uh, people who were imprisoned in uh, Gulag, in the Reels, for instance, um, to have a something they could stand on and claim their rights and claim the human rights. And this tool was crucial, to my opinion, in breaking um, the anti-human system of the Soviet Union. So I think, uh, with, res with regard to human rights, um, the, the legislation system of the EU, the, the fact that Ukraine belongs somehow or connected to EU, will help much more for uh, human rights in Ukraine than just uh, freeing Yulia Timoshenko or Yuri Lutsenko. Thank you. I just, I mean, I totally agree um, with what you said, that obviously the, the EU process can help improve human rights um, in Ukraine, uh, for sure it's important. Well, any, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am Vladimir Lesuk, I represent the company Ukraine Industry Expertise, so we are experts in Ukraine industry. and. Uh, uh, maybe some sentiments about our previous discussions. Um, everybody of us would like to see Ukraine as a power regional leader, of course, but we understand the real state of our infrastructure, our economy, and we know that uh, our uh, production facilities, technology, infrastructure are very outgraded now in this situation. So the access to European Union will help maybe not only in sense of getting some funds, some money, some investment in Ukraine, but also um, uh, taking the uh, experience of European in more transparent regulation of economy, less corruption and so on, because that's the main problem for Ukraine and for the progress for Ukraine. And uh, also we know that the European Union is the biggest trade partner of Ukraine. And we now have a recession in industry production and the European Union also have a recession. Maybe a recession in Ukraine also is joined with the situation in the European Union because, for example, for exporting steel sector and steel products, our uh, European Union uh, is very important. But my questions will be the next. Uh, now we have not very good and favorable economical background for our progress in signing this uh, uh, association agreement. So. Um, uh, can you say about uh, uh, how uh, much is the uh, effect of this uh, not very good economic background for all the process? Does it influence all the process of signing agreements, the, uh, not very good economical situation in the European Union? And the second one question also, do you agree that joining Ukraine to European Union will contribute also uh, European Union because Ukraine is a very big territory in Europe with the population, natural resources and so on. And uh, uh, can it also help for European Union as a space for investment, for production and for the further growth of economic of European Union? Thank you. 
Um, yes, in answer to that question, yes, of course, um, Ukraine, um, once it, it's reached, it, let's say, its development potential, I mean, Ukraine has plenty of potential, it's just sitting there waiting to be um, utilised, has the ability to become, you know, a key economic driver um, of the European Union. I mean, it's been said many times in the past, um, that if the EU wants to become, let's say, a real global player, um, they need to take on board uh, countries who have the potential to push this forward. And this would include, of course, Ukraine um, and Turkey. So, of course, I, I, I agree with, with what you said. On the second point, if I understood correctly, do you mean um, the, the EU's economic crisis or Ukraine's economic crisis? Uh, EU, of course. EU. Okay. Does it influence all the process? Yeah. No, I don't think the EU's economic crisis has any influence at all um, on the signing of the association agreement. But of course, one of the <coughs> criteria from the EU side uh, is also linked to improving uh, the business and investment climate um, in Ukraine, which is in a, in a quite a, let's say a poor condition, um, to put it mildly. Yeah, before Alexei will, will have his... Uh have his uh, remark, I would like to have mine. Uh, just a few days ago, I uh, uh, almost had a uh, standing uh, ovation after I told uh, on some investors' uh, meeting that Ukraine is not to be considered to be a market anymore because 45 million people is a small number. We have to understand that because when we see the figures of Nigeria, for example, in uh, 30 years, having uh, eight times more population of 400, peop 400 million people, then we have to look at that as a market. And if Ukraine thinks that way, that we are a part of Europe, whatever uh, institutionally it is formed, but not as a market, because we are not a market in that sense which Nigeria or the other uh, African or Asian Com uh, countries grow, then it would be easier for, for us to to, uh, to accept that chemical uh, supplies or uh, the raw uh, iron supplies to Europe is not trade and we need GDP five times higher and we cannot achieve that in any case by that supplies we have in Europe. So. Nothing to, uh, nothing to expect from that sectors. We need other sectors which can be organized only with strategic investors from Europe, but not selling here in Ukraine because it is small market, but selling somewhere where they know how to sell. Let them uh, revive their African uh, partners, former colonies, and help us to sell together our products to, to that market, which uh, can be attractive. That's my opinion. Please. Uh, First, uh, just a short comment to you. Market, it's not only about the number of population, it's about the capacity of concrete person by population. How much is the person eager to buy something? And for example, in Nigeria and Ukraine, per capita GDP are different. And that's why our population uh, could buy a little bit even more than Nigeria's population due to other factors. But coming back to your question, it is exactly, I don't agree with you, uh, Amanda, that it is exactly due to the crisis that uh, European Union is much more eager to sign the agreement, especially DCFTA, which will be enforced immediately after signing the agreement and not after ratification of the agreement, what is going to happen with political part and what is not going actually to happen, because we will have the problem with ratification if we sign it this November. Because for European business now, and it's a process which I obviously do know quite well, for example, in Germany or in Austria, business association who deal with any question related to Eastern Europe or to post-Soviet space, they push their politicians to change their mind, because they exactly in the time of crisis, they do need, even small markets, they do need extremely, because they are in crisis. And they do need the possibilities, because even now, until all failures of last 20 years, Ukraine is quite a good prospective market. It's just nearby. There are many success stories near on the border, in Poland, Hungary, Slovak Republic, Czech Republic, where actually there is uh, 
many examples of success stories if everything or mostly are properly prepared and then implemented. That's why there are even success stories here in Ukraine with many of the businesses, but despite uh, many other factors. That's why exactly due to the crisis now, I see just uh, the business of the European Union is quite good in probably lobbying, okay, guys, let's sign with those Ukrainians the agreement because DCPA will be enforced immediately after signing. And then you can talk about ratification, politics, and something like this. This is, from my point of view, this is the position. And this is probably a normal position because business is about money. Politics as well, but not so much. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I have a question to all speakers. My name is uh, Vyacheslav Vyashenko. I represent the young generation uh, who have studied in Austria, in EU, who lived, who uh, work, uh, who know what is this uh, to live in the European Union. And uh, how do you think, how many people understand what does it mean to be a part of the European Union? Really? Understand this. Huh? Ukraine. Ukraine, yes, yes. Well, I would imagine it's quite a small figure, um, the amount of people that actually really understand um, what the EU is all about, what European uh, integration uh, is all about. But again, this is a this is a question of communication uh, and public diplomacy, um, both from the side uh, of the EU and from the Ukrainian uh, authorities. That needs to be. Um, improved. I think we've seen, you know, just if you look at all the association agreement uh, and DCFTA, there were very, very few efforts from either either side, the EU side or the Ukrainian side, um, to really explain uh, to the population um, what these two initiatives um, were all about, let alone the broader um, e the EU project um, as a whole. Uh, whereas we know some other um, countries were quite good at, at explaining why these two initiatives weren't really that interesting and why their initiatives uh, were far more interesting. But I mean, quite frankly, a lack of knowledge um, on the EU is not really anything new. I mean, in many EU member states, um, there's a, a substantial lack of knowledge um, as to what the EU is all about, including in my own uh, country in the UK, um, which is now considering withdrawing its uh, membership of the EU. So of course it's something that needs to be addressed. You can always do better public diplomacy and communication strategy uh, to improve this, uh, which definitely needs to be to be looked at by both sides. This is probably I just like to add. This is quite an interesting example where we do need uh, actually to talk with many of the people what is exactly the European Union because to to expect the European Union to be a paradise, it's a wrong perspective. Beforehand, we have some communistic dream, so the communists will come and everything will be okay, nobody will need to, to work. Uh, now, for some of the people who doesn't know about reality in the EU, this is like communism. That somebody from outside will come and will solve all our problems. That's why for some people, and it's, uh, it's not uh, a good tendency, they expect you to solve their problems, probably to remove the current power or to remove uh, these uh, huge gaps in social economic development. And it, it will not happen in any case. That's why and it will be once more this uh, non-success story for Ukraine when we expect too much, do nothing for reaching some quite uh, good goals and then we try to blame anybody else from outside um, while we are we are actually the persons who should be blamed by themselves. That's why it's very... And for the EU it now to confront positively, to confront with this picture, you do need probably a dramatical progress in visa issue. Because until now, it's much more about documents, much more about declarations, visa liberalization strength. But if we take honestly now the tendency, if beforehand we had the problems with the numbers of rejections, and even now, I don't know if anybody in the audience do know that per capita, Schengen visa is much more given for the best democratic state in Europe, Belarus, then the second best democratic state in Europe, Russia, and then probably to Ukraine per capita. This is just about the standards and rules. 
And then as well, um, this is now the issue. Okay, there is a decrease of number of rejections, but now we have the situation that multi visa Schengen is not so eager to get by the Ukrainian citizens. I don't know for uh, some matters. It's the history during the last year or the last two years. I don't know why it is happening just now, but it is, this is the reality. And let's be honest, let's do something, because if much more many Ukrainian citizens have a chance, even for one week, to travel to the European Union to look for all these standards that are out to get this practical experience, it, which it would be much more better for European integration of Ukraine than any TV talks, any conferences held in any audience, because it's a practical experience, it would be much more better to have economic progress, bilateral, mutual beneficial progress in economics, not only holding Ukraine as, okay, some kind of good farmland, where we could invest something to good, good harvest and take out, and then to some market. Okay. That's it. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm very tempted to... to but, uh, I think I agree with you. I would be I would be very happy if we had uh, visa liberalisation uh, now. Uh, I would I would have so much more time to do uh, you know more meaningful work, uh, and I would have uh, uh, about 15 of my staff uh, doing other work or probably uh, working somewhere else more productively. Uh, but I think let's be honest, uh, uh, as I said with the visa liberalization and action plans, uh, uh, this, this is a clear list of what needs to be implemented, not by the European Union, but very clearly understood and agreed uh, by the Verkhovna Rada and needs to be implemented by Ukrainian authorities. Now, for some people, you know, this may sound as a very difficult exercise, but let me show you how many countries have achieved that? Uh, you know, countries, when you ask somebody in Austria, they would be scared, you know? Uh, Montenegro, Bosnia, uh, Macedonia, Albania, you know? And they have been much faster in implementing very similar measures and steps. Uh, now, I really don't understand why Ukraine is dragging its feet on this issue, because it's purely and uniquely in the interest of Ukraine. I would be more than happy to see that uh, uh, progress uh, much faster. On the other hand, uh, just to, to give you an understanding why visa issue is, 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 is something that is, is still out there, uh, and I think why the association agreement will be helpful in, in reducing these kind of disparities. Uh, Austrian population, Eight million people um, uh, managed to have, you know, a greater GDP as uh, Ukraine with 45 million people. I think this also, for me, as, as a, an ambassador from a small country, small and medium-sized country, as we say, that it's not about size, it's not about strategic value, it's not about, you know, the most uh, productive agriculture. It's about rules and predictability. Business, as you say, is about money, but business is about predictability. Business climate in Ukraine has certainly not improved over the last two years, and I would be in a position to confirm that with a dozen of you know personal examples. Um, if I'm not working with visa affairs, I'm busy with naming problems and some Austrian investors or business people have. Um, and in that respect, uh, eight million people uh, if the numbers are right, that's the amount of pensioners in Ukraine who receive their minimum pension. Uh, now, one other figure, 77% uh, of Ukrainians have never traveled, never left the country. Um, and in, 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 set, in that sense, I think there, there is a potential that is, in certain countries, perceived in, in a bit more you know, skeptical and critical way. And to be honest, uh, Russia, uh, yes, the, the visa numbers we've seen in Russia have been have been rising very very fast over the last ten years. But then again, average income of a Russian citizen, you tell me, is probably three times higher than the Ukrainian one. 
Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the numbers I know, we've seen a steady increase and, and, and certainly a strong increase uh, with the visa numbers in the Schengen partner countries here in Ukraine at our embassy and we've seen a lot more long-term visa <coughs> and a lot more multi-travel uh, 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 visa. So I, I think we, we, we see strong progress, but I, I think one has to see the work that needs to be done. And I think we are, we are, we are all hoping that those two laws that are still in, in, in the process of being discussed uh, uh, will be passed soon. And then we'll be able to look at the implementation of all these laws, um, uh, uh, which is, is not an easy, easy, easy task as it is. I just like to add because it's very well, that's, important that's question. It's very, it's very well. important. It's about the strategy because, for example, we have experienced EU citizen for almost ten years visa-free regime with Ukraine, yes. and I listened to the I former, 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 former minister of foreign affairs who actually was initiator or deputy initiator that in 2005 they were cancelled. And now he told the person who is in favor of EU membership, in favor of association agreement signed, and now he told this year, probably I would have not signed this visa free regime for EU citizen, because now we experience 10 years waiting for something. Yes, of course, we should to blame ourselves that we have not implemented something like this, but the practice, for example, if you take the numbers, how many, it was very cautious, issue with the European Union when we signed visa liberalization regime about so-called people who just would be caught in the EU and should be sent back to Ukraine. And it was a huge objection from Ukrainian side that would be a huge numbers of some Ukrainians sent back from the EU due to them. Now, would you like to know the numbers of those people sent back from the EU to Ukraine? Probably two persons in the last year. So there is from a strategic point of view, there is no uh, just objections from the EU side to have some fear that millions of Ukraine immediately after visa-free regime would change their mind and go into the EU. It was the same case because I wrote my PhD thesis on Eastern enlargement and there was the fear from Germany and Austria that immediately after Eastern members, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovak entered the European Union, the millions or hundreds of thousands of safe Poles eh, will go to Austria, to Germany. Now, 10 years after, what we see, they were only fair. Both of the side have benefited from this. So sometimes we need the courage to make the first step. Thank you. Uh, maybe the last question or remark. All right. So the, the last the last question or remark. Дякую. Добрий вечір, шановна аудиторія. Я хотів би задати питання, що що буде потім, коли буде підписана підписаний документ. Мені цікаво, на ваш погляд, чи витримують українські товаровиробники, які задіють у сфері малого та середнього бізнесу конкуренцію європейських товаровиробників? Дякую. До відповідачів. До вам депо. I mean, first of all, once these documents are signed, um, I mean, there's not going to be any sort of miracle immediately. Um, they have to be implemented. Um, but on your second point, yes, you know, S SMEs in Ukraine um, will be affected, uh, and probably many of them will end up being put out of business, um, which um, is, has, was the case uh, in previous um, experiences. And this is, a, I'm sorry to say, this is this is a fact of life. Um, it's let's say short-term casualties. Um, for a long, a long-term, greater and positive <coughs> consequence, and this, this is the, you know, this is the ultimate cost of the, of the DCFTA that there are, there are going to be some short-term uh, casualties um, of the process. But still, in the long term, uh, Ukraine is going to be, it's, it's going to be a win-win situation. That's what I would say. Thank you. Well, in fact, uh, I can answer also that question. Uh, Sometimes when I when I have a look at uh, that uh, maybe terrible consequences as usually expressed, uh, especially in the Russian supported media uh, of uh, DFTA, I I always 
think about the companies which I run just uh, five years ago, and I understand that uh, in fact the influence will be in uh, the other area. The influence will be in, in the area, maybe n not exporting to Nigeria from, uh, from Ukraine, but to other markets which Europeans possess. Because uh, we all here, especially small, medium-sized businesses, uh, we were taught on the old Soviet uh, system of deficit. And we all still are concentrated on our market. And we all still concentrated on protectionism. That we manufacture something here for our local market. Because Soviet Union did not have any consumer goods and that's why still after 20 years of, of uh, uh, independence people think about this small local market look at austria look even at big turkey well i show uh, <laughs> to your side but but you know turkey even 80 million population you see the company in turkey which has 20 people and it has 20 countries of export you never see this in ukraine because of uh, bad thinking, not because they, that Ukrainians cannot produce something which can be exported to 20 countries of the world. They, even in Turkey, they have the best uh, homes near Istanbul airport. Why? Because he has three trips a week abroad. And if he is 100 kilometers on the other side of Istanbul, he never comes home. He always have a, a sleep uh, in the hotel near the uh, near the airport because his next visit is next day or the day the day after. So let's think about that uh, and in, in let's think in that direction. But in any case, we come to the end and uh, I give the floor to Amanda Paul with the last comment. I actually just wanted to make a comment about this uh, Turkey issue actually because now, interestingly, SMEs in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Um, or one of the you know significant driving force uh, behind the Turkish economy. Several years there was an organisation called Tuscon uh, that was created. It represents SMEs, and Tuscon basically created um, what they call trade bridges um, between Turkey and Africa, Turkey and Brazil, Turkey and Russia, and they basically brought, uh, or they still do bring, thousands and thousands of SMEs uh, to Turkey um, for meetings and cooperation to build. Uh, to, to do business between Turkish SMEs and the SMEs from these countries. Uh, and they do this globally, and it's, it's been a significant element uh, in the Turkish economy. And I think it's something that actually Ukrainian um, SMEs could, could actually learn from uh, the Turkish experience. I think actually Tuscon had a trade bridge with Ukraine as well. Uh, so I think they were here too. So it's worthwhile, I think, that you can learn a lot of things from um, the Turkish experience in this area. Um, but I don't really have any closing comments to make um, because normally it's the chairman that makes the closing comments and I'm not. Uh, but I'd just like to say that it was a real pleasure uh, to be here today, tonight, um, to talk to you, to hear your views um, and to have so many interesting questions from a very interesting audience. So I'd like to thank you for that um, and wish uh, Ukraine good luck in the next coming months and hopefully that we will have a, a very positive end uh, to the year and this agreement will finally be signed in Vilnius and we can all stop talking about it and then move on to talking about implementation. Thank you.